1941, Isaac Asimov published a short story in which a space station wirelessly transmits energy collected from the sun down to planet Earth using a focused microwave beam. Now, it's 2024 and Space Solar, a startup based in Oxford in the UK, is making plans to do the same. Using a 2 gigawatt satellite almost 2 kilometers in size that hangs 22,000 miles above us, sending down clean energy day and night. Humanity has long been captivated by the idea of a Dyson Sphere, efficiently harvesting the energy of the sun. Today, I want to talk about solar power in space, generally, but also I want to look specifically at the recent breakthrough by Space Solar in actually proving that you can get energy back down to Earth. I reached out to Sam Adlin, co-CEO of Space Solar, to understand more about what makes solar in space so captivating. We've got huge challenges with both net zero and, and, and energy demand generally. Uh, energy demand going to at least double by, by, by 2050. And we really don't have a, a credible solution for this. Net zero is really an illusion without new, more capable technologies. And in the sun, we've got an incredible long-term clean energy source. So space solar power is about how to use that in, a, in, in new ways that can really meet our energy needs for, for, for the 21st century. The idea of harvesting solar power in space and transmitting it to Earth has only transitioned out of the realm of total science fiction very recently. This new reality is largely due to a reduction in the costs associated with the idea, both for producing solar panels at scale and also for launching materials into space. Over the past couple of decades, the price of solar in particular has dropped significantly thanks to initiatives like the German feed-in tariff in the early 2000s that paid twice the market price for electricity generated from renewables like solar. Today, solar is cheaper than coal and natural gas, even without any further subsidies applied to it, which is a really interesting case study in how government backing and intervention can help new technologies generate market demand. This reduction in the price of solar is compounded by the reduction in the cost of launching materials into space. During the era of the Space Shuttle program, which ran from 1981 to 2011, the cost was approximately $18,000 to $22,000 per kilogram to get an item into space. But nowadays, recent projections from companies like SpaceX are forecasting a launch for the Starship of $3 million for a 150 ton payload. That's $20 per kilogram. That is an astronomical, no pun intended, drop in price point that will fundamentally change the economies of commercializing space. Though, yes, you do need to take everything Mr. Musk says with a small grain of salt and an understanding of inherent hyperbole. So building a space solar power station in, in orbit is something that the world is is moving quickly towards so we're entering a completely new era in terms of how we use space with, with things like starship coming online so we've lived to date in a mass constrained era in space where the natural thing is to launch things to be as far apart as possible from each other uh, you do that so that you avoid things like collisions and for interference but actually it's a stupid way of using an asset absolutely daft and what what we're getting now with with the onset of starship is we will move towards launching stuff to cluster and be together. It's what will drive economic interaction and, and the future growth of the sector. So something like space-based solar power is really the first cab off the rank in terms of the sorts of large infrastructure that we'll be able to build in space. But think data centers, direct mobile communications, new materials in space. These are all things that this new era in space is, is going to drive. This makes the interest in solar projects in space both economically somewhat believable for the first time ever, particularly for projects on this size and scale. And these projects are big. Space Solar aims to produce a solar harvesting station 1.7 kilometers in diameter. That's more than twice the length of the largest man-made object ever, the Burj Khalifa. And they intend to construct it in space, requiring an estimated 68 missions to move the required materials into orbit. The station, Cassiopeia, will use 60,000 solar panels that collect the sunlight from a pair of reflectors that align to capture sunlight regardless of the orientation of the station. Initial estimates, which we have known about for a while now, but that look to be backed up by an independently conducted report by Fraser Nash, suggest that plants could produce 2 gigawatts of energy, which is about the same as a nuclear power station. 
The question is, how do you get that solar energy that is collected back to Earth? We're going to cover off that question in detail, but first I have to thank today's sponsor that makes these sorts of long form episodes possible. We're on the pathway to unlocking solar power from space, but there will always be need for energy resilience on a home by home scale to protect against fragile energy grids or extreme weather events. That's why I'm excited to be working with today's sponsor, Anchor Solix, who just announced the Anchor Solix X1. The X1 is a modular at home battery designed to be expanded from 5 to 180 kilowatt hours and up to a 36 kilowatt power rating. Combining the X1 with a solar panel system reduces your energy bills as it can switch between time of use mode to charge your batteries while energy prices are at their lowest or NEM 3.0 mode to sell electricity as fast as possible while prices are highest. In the event of an extreme weather warning from the local weather service, the X1 activates its built-in storm guard mode, automatically charging itself to maximum capacity. If a power outage occurs, it seamlessly transitions to powering your home in less than 20 milliseconds and it's capable of simultaneously powering high power appliances like air conditioners and washing machines. During extended power outages, the X1 automatically sets up a microgrid for your home, recharging itself from your solar panels even in extreme temperatures from minus 4 Fahrenheit to as high as 131 degrees Fahrenheit. The X1 is a whole home backup power system. It can be upgraded in capacity as your needs grow and it's been future-proofed so it can use a mixture of existing as well as future battery designs. Its modular approach means that if one battery pack fails, it doesn't affect the overall operation of the system. The X1 can be remotely controlled and monitored on the Anker app to help users optimize their power usage. Each battery module also has a built-in energy optimizer allowing it to independently charge or discharge, providing up to 2,300 kilowatt hours more energy than other solutions on the market. And its sleek and minimal design means that it looks great and doesn't take over your whole garage. The X1 is built to give you energy independence and reduce your home's bills. If you'd like to check them out, follow the link down below or in the description to learn more. Thank you to Anchor Solix for supporting the channel. Now, back to the video. The idea of transmitting power across free space, otherwise called wireless power transmission, sounds like the stuff of mysterious Nikolai Tesla folklore, often lamented for the lost technologies of the past. But you'll be pleased to know that this isn't the case. So much like communications went from wire to wireless, the future of power is very much wireless as well. You've got organizations like DARPA looking at this in the US, grid operators looking at this, or ways to get power from on offshore to onshore. We've actually made a lot of progress in the technologies necessary to make energy transmission, even from outer space, a possibility. The Oxford-based team are looking to use a well-established technique as the basis for their approach, an energy beam steered by a phased array. If you've taken a physics or engineering course before, you've probably covered the basics of these, but the operating principle I always find equal parts simple and surprising that it works. If you take a radio antenna and apply an alternating electric field or voltage to it, this sends out an oscillation into the electromagnetic field around the antenna, ultimately making you a really boring radio station and a really inefficient way of sending energy from A to B. We can visualize this antenna as just an oscillating point in space sending out radio waves in all directions. An interesting thing happens though if we place two of these antennas next to each other, oscillating in sync with each other. Now we get an interference pattern between these two waves, cancelling in some places and adding in others. That looks a lot like a double slit interference pattern, largely because to a certain extent it is. If we continue adding antennas, this effect compounds and we start to notice that very little wave disturbance is moving in some directions and a lot is moving in others. We are now now sending energy in a specific direction. This is also how cell phone towers work, to make sure that the cell phone signal that they are sending is outward and downward towards the ground, not up into the sky which would be a waste of electricity. There's one last trick we can do in this system. If we add a delay in the antennas from left to right, this changes how the signals interfere. The result is the beam is steered left or right, depending on the relative delay between the antennas. And you can imagine this is just in 2D. You could also build an array in 3D, and now you can steer up, down, left, and right, and make sure your power is transmitted to the location of interest down on, say, planet Earth. But how is Space Solar taking this approach and adapting it into their designs? It's, it, it's neat. So um, I, I, could, I could take the laptop over and show you now. It's gonna, it's, this is going to be interesting. So here's a picture, Ben, of the a, a, a sort of 3D mock-up of the, the helical structure. And if I take it above the structure, 
the lights are pointing down from the top and you see the different steps there it's the steps that have the pv on it and then if you look from the side you can see the the antennas there and so the 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 system then beams out horizontally towards towards me in in 360 degrees depending on where the uh the pilot beam's coming from. The breakthrough announcement that you might have seen in the news recently was that the team proved that their design, spreading the antennas across this helical spiral system, is capable of transporting energy wirelessly and steering that beam to the desired location, here a transceiver on the far wall. And that's a really important proof of their design principle. One of the challenges with, with, with space solar power is, is, is as you go around orbits, you see the sun at different angles. There's lots of sort of fairly flat panel approaches, but certain parts of the year they get, or, or day and night, they get absolutely zero incident energy. So other designs have very complicated mechanical rotating joints. What the Casio Helical design does is it's a completely solid state solution to this, but it beams in 360 degrees like a lighthouse um, and provides a constant aperture towards the earth. Um, so it's a very, very novel solution and it massively reduces the mass because all the components are used all the time. Other designs, components are used, say, half the time. Mass is about 60% of the capex of a, of a system. So it really does provide really compelling costs in, in terms of the, the ultimate cost of electricity that, that, um, that comes out of the system. Inherent to this phased array approach is that it requires no moving parts. It's steered entirely by electronic signal delay, which reduces the chances of failure that would potentially end a mission based out in space. The Space Solar team will use a beam in the microwave frequency of 2.45 gigahertz, partly chosen because it easily penetrates the atmosphere, even in the case of cloud cover and rain, which you can see in this diagram that is so hard on the eyes only a physicist could have made it. Back on Earth, the power that is delivered is captured by a similar similar but much larger array of antennas estimated to require a small fraction of the footprint of a modern day wind farm, about 8% according to Space Solar. And as evidence of what is possible, while no systems have operated at the proposed energy scales of the Space Solar system, similar technologies have run terrestrial proof of concepts, including microwave transmitters sending power from Maui to Hawaii, a 148 kilometer distance back in 2008, and Mitsubishi transmitted a 10 kilowatt beam over 500 meters back in 2015. Last year, a team out of Caltech used their Maple system to demonstrate energy transmission from space using off-the-shelf transmitters. So we aren't in the field of, is this science possible? We are much more asking the question of how do we optimize the engineering? And that is a good thing for this technology. But are we out of the woods yet? Definitely no. Building something of this size in space has never been done before, and that will be a huge challenge. So let's talk about some of the concerns. The initial projection for the cost of the first project is just under 12 billion pounds. Reasonably steep, but subsequent systems should be significantly cheaper on the order of about 3 billion pounds. And that's comparable, if not slightly cheaper, than new nuclear sites. But honestly, I never put too much faith in exact projections this far out from having a technology in hand. Instead, I think it's better to look at the trends. And those trends are the cost of launching is tending down, solar is tending down, and construction in space, well, we don't really have an idea yet, that's probably a major risk factor. In-orbit assembly of anything like this scale has never been demonstrated, so you're looking at a black box at the moment with any number of things that could go wrong. Space Solar's next challenge is how do they tackle this problem in a sensible and scalable way? And so to build the, the a Space Solar Power Station, for us it's in a, to a total of 68 Starship launches for a 2 gigawatt system. Um, and then these are assembled by, it's fairly simple robotics in, in many ways. These are, these systems are comprised of hundreds of thousands of the same dinner plate size modules designed to be clipped together. And so it's sort of fairly simple assembly line type robotics, not sort of complicated robotic arms and, and, and that sort of thing. So where we've got to with, with Space Solar now, uh, we've created the monolithic design for our system. And the next step is how you then slice and dice and, and, and build the plans for how to 
build it in space. For the moment, the full innovation load rests on the shoulders of the companies aiming to deploy these solar technologies, and that should be scary both to those companies and to people thinking about investing in those companies. I've seen in other people's coverage a lot of people expressing concern about safety of these systems. People often cite solar concentrator examples as the cause of their worry, which yes, have been known to accidentally incinerate birds, leaving tiny smoke trails in their wake. And we already know that people have a problem with 5G, which is harmless. So I'd imagine that we will have a bigger problem with an energy beam being directed down to Earth from space. Are we right to be concerned? From a first pass practical point of view, all systems are fallible, regardless of how clever their safety engineering is. So let's take that as given that the idea that if something could go wrong at some point, it will go wrong, regardless of the reason. Let's run through some of the numbers though behind the space solar system. They estimate an energy intensity of about one quarter of the midday sun. As far as initial studies run by NASA conclude, this is safe for human beings and we shouldn't have any partially microwaved humans running around anytime soon. 2.5 gigahertz is also a reasonably long wavelength, about the size of your hand, so photons don't contain the energy to damage DNA. The likely deployment point of these systems will also be offshore, according to the company occupying about 6 kilometers by 13 kilometers at UK latitudes. That's elliptical because the Earth is curved, which flat earthers might not like. In terms of interlock or safety systems, any deviation of the beam from the intended collection point will trigger a failsafe stopping the power beaming process. There's also often a lot of mention in comment sections of coverage of these sorts of stories about the inefficiency of these systems. How exactly do they stack up? PV up in space, so we use high concentration photovoltaics, about 40% efficient. RF to DC conversion is about 85% efficient. The other loss is there's about 2% loss through the atmosphere. The beam, because of diffraction, ends up as a bell curve, an airy disk. And so depending on where you where you chop the edge of the receiving antenna off, you, you've got some losses there with, that's about 90% efficient. And then you've got DC to RF at the other end, again, 85%. Sun to plug compared to terrestrial solar. Terrestrial solar is about 1% efficient. Space solar power sun to plug is about 18% efficient. We may find that the answer is just make the hardware more powerful, which has been the recourse of bad software engineers for a very long time now. Making these systems bigger on Earth in a solar farm is difficult because land is very expensive, but it is basically free to make this system larger in space basically free. It's a bit of a weird way of looking at the problem, but if the actual space of land on Earth occupied is one of your concerns, the initial estimates for the same land area usage suggest that space-based solar power could produce 2.5 times more annual power than terrestrial solar farms, or about 12 times more than offshore wind farms. I haven't seen it talked about a lot, but I also like the idea that it could be providing power during the day to one location and somewhere else during that location nighttime, or if there was a low power requirement almost instantly switching to another location. So a single infrastructure project might actually be able to service multiple locations. My ending reaction to this space, no pun intended, though this is one of the first times that I've looked into it, is this is an interesting field, yes, partly because I'm biased and I really want a Dyson Sphere to exist, but also because in solving the problems associated with getting these structures set up in space, we learn how to set up these sorts of structures in space, which I think opens a lot of doors to applications. Not that it needs it, but it also provides further volume and demand drivers to lower the cost of solar and space launches. Space Solar wants to install their first commercial solar farm in space within the next decade. However, they are aiming to launch an initial prototype in the next three years, followed by a larger version before 2030, able to power a village of around a thousand homes. I think a space-based power generating system of some form is an inevitability. Whether it's the UK, America, or China, all of which are working on this technology, someone will get there. The question is, will it be this first wave of ventures that get it right, or who among them will be the first or do it best? I think that is still very much to be determined at this point, but I will always champion smart folk trying to tackle really hard problems, because you never know where the output, the pursuit of these answers will lead us. If you like this video, leave a like or a comment down below. If you're interested in other technologies making their way into space, I just covered how to build the first force field. Check it out here or wherever I left it, potentially down in the description down below. 
As always, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.